So we saw that graphs are going to be interesting objects to represent relations and we have to do some computations on the graph. So in order to compute on a graph, we need to represent the graph. So to work with a graph, we need to transform this picture into something that we can manipulate in an algorithm. Right? So we said for instance, we have these vertices and edges and then we have paths and we have reachability. Now if I look at this as a picture, as a, as a human being, I can kind of see that this thing is connected. Or maybe if there are edges I may not be able to see, I may have to calculate that it is connected. Right? Now if it is a much larger graph, even visually it may not be possible. And certainly I cannot use this kind of visual uh, analogy to write an algorithm. So the algorithm has to represent this graph in a more uh, kind of concrete way and manipulate this representation in such a way that it can solve these problems without relying on this intuition of what the picture looks like. So the picture is helpful for us, but it is not helpful for an algorithm. So we need to represent this graph in some simple way that we can manipulate. So the first thing is we need to represent the sets of underlying objects. So let's start with the vertices. So we saw that the vertices could be named in many different ways. So in one of the early examples, we saw names of teachers and courses. So each vertex had a name of either a person or a course. We also saw another graph in which the names corresponded to friends in a group. So we could have many different ways of representing the vertices. So we will choose typically a very simple representation. We will just say that if we have n vertices that we will label them 0, 1, 2 up to n minus 1. So we will always think of the vertex names as numbers between 0 and n minus 1 when there are n vertices. So essentially we have to have some way of taking the original graph and mapping them. right? So here for instance we have a graph where we call them v0, v1 up to v9. So I will replace this by 0 up to 9. So now if I look at an edge, an edge now because vertices are all numbers between 0 and n minus 1, an edge is also a pair of numbers i comma j. But as we said before, we will not allow reflexive relations in graphs. So we will not allow an edge to start at i and end at i. So when we say that i comma j is an edge, i and j must both be between 0 and n minus 1, that is in the allowed range of vertices, but i should not be equal to j. So with this representation, or this uh, way of representing edges and uh, matrices uh, and vertices, the most obvious way to represent the graph as a whole is to record which edges are present and which edges are absent in a table or a matrix called an adjacency matrix. So we have rows and columns 0 to n minus 1 and we put an entry at i comma j. So I have a matrix that looks like this, right? So I put an entry at row i and column j. I put this to 1 if there is actually an edge from i to j. Right? So this is now a 0, 1 matrix and the 1s represent those edges which are present in my graph. Everywhere else there will be zeros. So here for instance is how you would possibly do it in Python if you use a numpy array. So first of all, the actual graph could be represented explicitly by a set of edges. So here for instance, if I, as I said, if we replace this by 0 and this by 1 and this by 2 and so on, we have an edge from 0 to 1, we have an edge from 0 to 4, we also have an edge from 4 to 0 which is a separate edge and so on. So the edge list here represents in a literal way the arrows which are drawn in the graph there. But we want to translate this into the 0, 1 matrix. Right? So what we do is we know that we have 0 to 9 in this case, so we create a 10 by 10 matrix 0 to 9, 0 to 9, initialize it to zeros. Right? So this is a numpy uh, initialization which says give me a matrix of all zeros of size 10 by 10. And now we scan through this list. Right? So for every i comma j pair which we see in this list of edges, we set the ijth entry of the matrix to 1. So we already initialized it to 0. So wherever we did not find an edge, it is implicitly 0. So if we do this, then we get a matrix which we can visualize like this. Right? So for instance, here it says that 3 comma 4 is 1 which means that in my graph I should have an edge from 3 to 4 or it says that 7 comma 6 is 0 so if I look at 7 and 6 I should not find an edge between them. Right? So the zeros represent edges which are not there, the ones represent edges which are there. So if this is actually a 
undirected graph, then remember that if ij is an edge, ji will also be an edge. So if I take the same graph that I had before, right, and I remove the directions, I get this undirected graph. Now the matrix will be symmetric, right? So if I see 0, 1, I must see 1, 0. So if I take this diagonal here, right, and if I take any entry which is above the diagonal, then if I go the same distance below the diagonal, I will find, so if I have 4, 7, I will have 7, 4. So there is a kind of symmetry over this main diagonal, right? So everything above and everything below the main diagonal, there will be a symmetric, either it's both 1s or both zeros. So now we need to manipulate in terms of this matrix. So earlier when we had this picture, if we wanted to go to the neighbor of a vertex, if we wanted to extend a path for instance, then we just look at all the outgoing arrows and see which are all the neighbors which are connected to the outgoing arrows. So in an adjacency matrix representation, this corresponds to looking along a row, right? So basically what we have is say the neighbors of 6 are 3 and 5. This means that if I look at the row 6 in my matrix, if I look at all the entries here, these are all entries of the form 6, j, right? So some of these 6, j pairs are in my edge relation, some are not. So it turns out that 6, 3 is there and 6, 5 is there. So here is a simple Python function which computes the neighbors of a given vertex and returns it as a list. So it takes an adjacency matrix which is given and it takes uh, i as the vertex for whom you want to find the neighbors, right? So what you do is you initialize the list of neighbors to be empty. Now you need to find out the size of this matrix. So uh, NumPy has this shape attribute which tells you the number of rows and columns. In this case, remember it's going to be a square matrix, so rows and columns are going to be the same. You need either of them. We will use columns, right? So because we're going to scan through the columns. So for every j in the range columns, which is for every j from 0 to n minus 1, if I see that the vertex i that I'm looking at has a neighbor in j, then I append j to the list of neighbors and I return it. Right? So if I run this function on this particular example, if I run it on 7 for instance, right? so if I start in row 7, then I will pick up 4, I will pick up 5 and I will pick up 8. So this should be 4, 5 and 8. Right? So this is what the function should return on this graph. So if I have a directed graph, the rows represent outgoing edges, right? And these are not the same as the incoming edges because not every outgoing edge has a matching incoming edge. So the columns represent the incoming edges. So if I look at row 6, right, then this entry represents an edge from 6 to 5. If I look at column 6, this represents an entry from 3 to 6. So it's saying from 3 there is an edge into 6 and from 6 there is an edge out into 5. And there's no correspondence between these two in general. They could be but they need not be. So the degree of a vertex, as you know, is the number of edges which are incident on it. So if I'm just looking at an undirected graph, then I know that if you look at this thing, for instance, so the column 6, okay, so this has two ones and this has two ones because if I have an edge from 6 to 3 and three, 6 to 5, I also have incoming edges from 3 to 6 and 3 to 5 because there are no directions. So I just need to see how many edges are connected to 6 and I get the degree, which is 2. But if I have a directed graph, this is no longer the same. So I look at the outgoing degree. So it says that the out degree of 6 is 1 and it says the in degree of 6 is 1. So there is one edge coming in and one edge going out. In general, these need not be the same. So if you look at, uh, for instance, uh, let us see an example. Supposing you look at 1, for example, uh, or vertex 0, it has two edges going out, right? It has 0 to 1 and 0 to 4. So it has an out degree of 2. But if I look at the in degree of here, oh, it has 2 here also. It has 4 to 0 and 2 to 0. So this is not, yeah, anyway. So you can have situations where you have unequal numbers of edges coming in and out. Okay. So let me see if I can spot one here. So I think in this particular graph, they are more or less all equal, but they need not be equal. Okay. So now, one of the questions that we asked was reachability, right? So we said, given these edges, we want to find out if there is a path from one vertex to another vertex. So concretely, if we interpret these as airline uh, routes, we said that Delhi is city 0, Madurai is city 9. Is there a route from 0 to 0 from 9? So 
the way we do this is a straightforward exploration. We start at 9 and we say, okay, if we start at 9, certainly we can reach 9 from there because we have to do nothing. Then we look at all the places we can reach from 9. So where, we, where can we go from 9? Well, if we look at the row of 9, right, it says that I can reach 8. So if I start from 9, then I can reach all its neighbors. In this case, it's 8. So now I say that 8 is also reachable from 9. Now I see where all I can go from 8. So 8 can go to 5, 8 can go to 7. Of course, 8 can come back to 9, but that's where I started. So it doesn't, doesn't add any new information. So I can now look at 5 and 7 and add them to my list. 9 is already there, but I have already, in some sense, I know that 9 is reachable. So there's no point in marking it again. So then I pick these up in turn. So I pick 5 and 7, for instance, right? And then I can extend my thing, saying that from 5, I can reach, for instance, 3 and 6, and then from maybe 7 I can reach 4, then from 4 I can reach 0 and then I can stop in this case because my target was to reach 0. So I may be able to reach more things from 9 but I am not really interested in knowing whether I can reach 1 or 2. Okay? So this is the type of calculation that we want to do with the graph, right? checking reachability. So abstractly we mark the source as reachable and then we systematically mark neighbors of marked nodes. So we say that 9 is reachable. So what are the neighbors of 9? 8, mark 8. What are the neighbors of 8? 5 and 7, mark them and so on. And we stop when the target is marked. But the main thing that we need to do is recognize that we don't go back and get into a loop. right? So we don't want to go back and say that from 8 we, we know that 9 is a neighbor. So let's go back and explore what we can reach from 9 because we already started with 9. right? So if we go back from 9, then we'll come back to 8 and then 8 will take us back to 9 and then we'll go round and round in circles without making progress. right? So we need a systematic way of making sure that we don't get into this loop. And as you uh, should remember, there are two ways to do this. One is called breadth first search, which actually does it layer by layer. How many things can you reach in one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. And then there is depth first search, which keeps following a path until you get stuck. Then it comes back and takes an alternative path and so on. Right? So we will look at these in detail. So what we are talking about now, right now, is representing the matrix, right? So representing the graph. So we want to make sure that the graph that we are dealing with is not a picture, but something that our algorithm can manipulate. So we came up with this uh, straightforward representation, which was this adjacency matrix, which had zeros everywhere except where there are edges, and these are ones. Now, as you can imagine, very often there will be mostly zeros and very few ones. So we could look for a more compact representation, and this is what is called an adjacency list. So notice that if I have, in an undirected graph, if I have n vertices, then each of these can be connected to n minus 1 others, and then they are symmetric, so we do not count them. So n into n minus 1 by 2 is the number of edges that I could have. So if I have n vertices, I have order n squared edges possible, but very often I do not. Right? Similarly, in a directed graph, that factor of 2 goes away, you have at most n into n minus 1 different edges. But in many realistic situations, the number of edges is actually not n squared. It's not order of n squared, but it's actually closer to order of n, right? So in such situations, most of my matrix will be zeros. So here, a better representation is what is called an adjacency list. That is, for every vertex, I explicitly record, instead of that whole sequence of zeros and ones in the matrix, I only record the ones. I only record those vertices which are connected. So here I say that zero vertex zero is connected to one and four. I don't have to put the other zeros which say is not connected to 2, is not connected to 3, is not connected to 5 and so on. Okay? So this is the adjacency list representation. So for every vertex, it just gives you the list. So it says 8 is connected to 5 and to 9. Right? We do not have to say it is not connected to 7, it is not connected to 0, it is not connected to 6 and so on. So the simplest way to build up such a list in Python is to actually use a dictionary. So we use the names of these vertices, in this case 0 to n minus 1, here 0 to 9 as the keys, right? And then for every edge that is there in my edge list, I just append it to this. So if I assume that the edges are given in ascending order, then I will get these adjacency lists also in ascending order. So it is very often convenient to assume that the lists are actually enumerated in the same way that the columns are enumerated. So if I have an edge from say 8 to 5 and 8 to 9, then the adjacency list of 8 will be 5, 9. It is not 9, 5. Right? So if I construct the adjacency list for this graph, for instance, it shows this dictionary. So 0 is connected to 1 and 4, 1 is connected to 2 and so on. 
So, for example, 8 is connected to 5 and 9. So, this is a more compact representation in general, especially if the number of edges is small with respect to n square. So, one of the advantages is that an adjacency list requires less space. Okay. Now, there are some disadvantages. Right. So, if I want to check whether i is connected to j, if I want to check whether i is connected to j in an adjacency matrix, I just have to look at the i j th row. So, supposing I want to know whether 5 is connected to 7, then, then I just have to look at the entry 5 comma 7 and say yes, 5 is connected to 7. On the other hand, if I want to check in the adjacency list whether 5 is connected to 7, I have to take this list and walk down the entire list. Right? So, this in this case, it is a small graph, so it is a small list. But in general, you can imagine that it takes more time because you have to look at that entire list and go from one end to the other and find it. On the other hand, if I want to add together all the neighbors, right, then it is more efficient to use the list because the non-neighbors are absent. So, if I have a few uh, small number of neighbors, I will pick them up from the list. If I have a large number of neighbors, also I will need to anyway scan them. But in an adjacency matrix, there is no way to find the neighbors except to scan all these n minus 1 entries in the columns. So, even if I have only one neighbor, I will not know it without looking at all the entries. So, in an adjacency matrix, finding all the neighbors always takes time proportional to the number of vertices, whereas in adjacency list, it actually takes time proportional to the degree or more precisely if you are doing a directed graph, the out degree. So, depending on what we are planning to do, one representation or the other can be more efficient. Very often, we will see that adjacency list is better than adjacency matrix for the kinds of problems that we are looking at. So, to summarize what we have said is that we cannot just think of graphs as pictures and then try to compute on them because this picture cannot be read by our algorithm. So, we need to represent this graph in some concrete form. So, we have two representations that we propose. One is the 0 and matrix, this adjacency matrix where i j represents, a i j represents the edge from i to j. So, it is 1 if there is an edge, 0 if there is no edge. So, I canonically change my vertex names from whatever they are to 0 to n minus 1. And in an adjacency list, think of it as a dictionary where the keys are 0 to n minus 1 and each key is attached to a list, the list of vertices which are connected to vertex i. Right? So, if I look up a, a square bracket i in an adjacency list, it gives me a list of values, precisely those neighbors. So, if I want to scan this list, it is only proportional to the degree of that vertex. So, with both of these, we can systematically explore the graph. So, we saw that we want to do the reachability kind of analysis and we have to do it, you know, starting the graph and mark all the vertices that are reachable. So, we will now describe how to do these computations using these representations.